On this week in Enterprise Deck, we have Mr. Curtis Franklin here today and Mr. Brian McHenry. And there's been some movement on the topic of Huawei here in the United States. We'll get into just how things will change for them. Plus, the solar winds ordeal has been the gift that keeps on giving in the security world. We'll talk about some of the new things there. Plus, you probably heard about the hack that tried to poison a small Florida town. Well, there's lots more info that's come out of that. We have Mr. Damon Small, Technical Director of Security Consulting at the NCC Group. And we'll just discuss the current events, plus just how vulnerable our public infrastructure is. You shouldn't miss it. Twilight on the set. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit. This week in Enterprise Tech, episode four thirty one, recorded February nineteenth, twenty twenty one. The Poison Keyboard. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Nareva. Getting your audio ready for meetings back in the office, Nareva Audio is designed for distancing. It automatically adapts to new room configurations so you're ready for the new normal and whatever comes next. Learn more at nareva.com slash twit. And by Forward Networks. Forward Networks reduces business risk by revolutionizing the way large networks are managed. Their advanced software delivers a digital twin of the network, a completely accurate mathematical model in software. Get a demo at forwardnetworks.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreska, your guide to this big world of the enterprise. But I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in our field, starting with our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's a senior analyst at Omdia. Curtis, how are you doing? And is your house guest getting you to upgrade anything yet? Well, I'm doing just fine, and uh, the house guest, I think, is still doing technical surveys here, so uh, (laughs) not sure precisely what we're going to have new and exciting before uh, the next week or two is over, but we're glad to have our uh, producer, Brian Chi, staying with us. Uh, The technical life of Central Florida is getting more exciting by the hour. Indeed, indeed. I'm sure he's getting antsy to uh, to find his own place pretty soon to uh, to put those upgrades in there as well. So hopefully you guys uh, you can get some of your stuff done as well. well. It was good seeing you, Curtis. Of course, we also have Mr. Brian Henry. He's the senior director of global security solutions at F5 Networks. Bam! Thanks for being here. How are things going over there on the right coast? Well, I'm um, getting my weekly six inches of snow. Uh, as we've come to expect uh, all throughout the month of January and February. And uh, I've got to say that uh, I, I'm getting very tired of my snowblower. Well, at least you have a snowblower. We got uh, we got two feet over here, and I, uh, I was trying to melt snow with uh, sand. So that was fun. <laughs> so I'm glad, glad you got the snowblower. That's not the recommended way we do it in the Northeast. I know. I know it. I know. I got to learn the right way because I'm coming over there pretty soon. So. We'll see. Thanks, Ben, for being here. Well, guys, we've had quite quite the uh, week in the enterprise. There's been some movement in the topic of Huawei, so we're going to talk about their potential future here in the U.S. Plus, the SolarWinds ordeal, it's been the gift that keeps on giving in the security world. We're going to get into some of the new newest involvement there. And, of course, you may have heard about the little ordeal that happened uh, in Florida where a hacker tried to poison a Florida town. Well, we have Damon Small. He's Technical Director of Security Consulting at NCC Group. And we're going to discuss some of those current events and just how vulnerable our public infrastructure is. But before we get into all that goodness, we do have to go into this week's news blips. Just as Moore's Law has taken over the silicon market, there has to be an equivalent to how fast new cutting-edge technology has been hacked as well. You may have heard about Apple's new M1 ARM-based silicon powering their latest MacBooks. Not only has the M1 made a significant impact in the market, but it has also caught the interest of hackers as well, especially the ethical research kind. That's right. Only a couple months after M1 was released, malicious code is already natively on the platform. The CPU supports an ARM64 instruction set. For a binary to natively run on M1, it must be compiled as a Mach 0 64-bit ARM64 
binary, which means developers must recompile their applications to be native on them. Apple realized that backwards compatibility was essential to ensure widespread customer adoption on new M1 systems, and it released Rosetta 2. Now, Rosetta will transparently translate those Intel instructions in the native ARM64 so the older applications can actually run seamlessly. Now, with the help of virus searching tools recently, a malicious binary was actually found on M1 devices supporting both Intel and Apple Silicon called Go search 22.app. Guess what? That thing is malicious. And not only that, it was signed by an Apple developer ID as well. Newly highly sought after silica means it will be the in the crosshairs of malicious actors and as well as researchers. Well, Kia is facing a $20 million ransomware attack, and the star player is Doppelpamer. Kia Motors America has reportedly been hit with a Doppelpamer ransomware attack in which operators have demanded $20 million for a decryptor and the promise to not leak stolen data. That's according to a report at Bleeping Computer. News of the attack follows a nationwide IT outage that Kia experienced this week. An outage affected its mobile UVO link apps, phone services, payment systems, owner portal, and internet site used by dealerships, according to the report. Some Kia websites alerted users to the outage, but a ransom note obtained by the publication indicates Kia Motors America was targeted by the Doppelpamer ransomware operators. In their note, the attackers say they targeted Kia parent company Hyundai, which so far appears to be unharmed. On a victim page on Tor, attackers claim to have taken a, quote, huge, end quote, amount of data and threatened to publish the information within two to three weeks if Kia doesn't fulfill the attacker's demands. Right now, the ransom is reportedly $20 million. If left unpaid for a certain but unspecified amount of time, that amount goes up to $30 million. Now, this is all part of a trend that we're seeing for ransomware actors to add extortion into the mix. Companies were getting too good at backing up and restoring undamaged data. Well, users of anti tracking software may now find that they're a little less uh, effective than they were before. The prospect of web users being tracked by the sites they visit has prompted several countermeasures over the years, including these anti-tracking extensions, enabling private or private uh, incognito browsing sessions, or clearing cookies. Now websites may have a new way to defeat all three. The technique leverages the use of fave icons, the tiny icons that the websites display in the user's browser tabs and bookmark links. Researchers from the University of Illinois Chicago said in a new paper that most browsers cache the images in a location that's separate from the ones used to store site data, browsing history, and cookies. Websites can abuse this arrangement by loading a series of fave icons on visitors' browsers that uniquely identify them over an extended period of time. The researchers write, Overall, while fave icons have long been considered a simple decorative resource supported by browsers to facilitate websites' branding, our research demonstrates that they introduce a powerful tracking vector that poses a significant privacy threat to users. As new regulations like GDPR and better default browser security put an end to tracking techniques like third-party cookies, websites and the corporations who own them will be seeking new methods of tracking. Research like this points to likely vectors that will be exploited until browser vendors and various privacy extensions can be updated to work and close these vulnerabilities. Now, sometimes I like to think that here on Twi has a pretty big impact on the enterprise IT market because we covered the Comcast ordeal that they decided to bring back their caps on their internet plans to consumers and the state of Massachusetts wasn't going to take it. Now, Comcast ordeal and their original plan for the Northeast imposed the cap in January 2021 while providing courtesy months in which you know, they capped customers can exceed that 1.2 terabytes without penalty, resulting in the first coverage charges or overage charges being assessed for data uses in April 2021. That's right, because because of the customers and just maybe our audience here, responses, Comcast has buckled under pressure. That's right. Comcast is delaying a plan to enforce its 1.2 terabyte data cap and overage fees in the Northeast U.S. until 2022. Now, the response from Comcast was this. 
We recognize that our data plan was new for our customers in the Northeast. And while only a very small percentage of customers need additional data, we are providing them with more time to become familiar with the new plan. I don't know about that. Now, Comcast has enforced the data cap in 27 of the 39 states in which it operates since 2016, but not in the Northeast states where Comcast faces competition from Verizon's uncapped Fios fiber to home service. Now, in t- November 2020, Comcast announced it would bring back the cap to 12 states the, and including District of Columbia. But with yesterday's announcement, no one in those 12 states in D.C. will be charged overage fees by Comcast until until all of 2022. Now, you might be wondering what areas applies to this delay. Well, the delay applies to Connecticut, Delaware, Massachusetts, Maryland, Maine, New Hampshire, New Jersey, North Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, West Virginia, and D.C. Unfortunately, that means that Comcast is not making changes in 27 other states. That means you need to get on the horn and stop putting pressure on them, especially those on the West Coast. Well, enterprise windows threats are dropping while Mac attacks are on the rise. You know, COVID-19 changed the way we live and work, and that's true for malware operators, just as it is for the rest of us. Last year, businesses saw Windows malware detections drop and Mac detections, detections rise as criminals tossed old tactics and focused on targeted attacks. In the Malware Bytes 2020 State of Malware report, they explore how attack techniques have changed among criminals who sought to steal information on prey on victims' fears with more advanced threats. For example, Windows malware detections dropped 24% for businesses and 11% among consumers, while Mac malware detections went up 31% for companies, but down 40% for consumers. Most obvious attack patterns across all of the platforms came down to data theft. That's according to Malwarebytes. Now, as COVID-19 changed the way we work, it creates a new target profile that many criminals never considered, and that's people working from home, accessing corporate resources from corporate laptops in individual residencies. Top detections for business Windows machines included Drydex, which is a banking and information stealing Trojan that spiked 973% in detections between 2019 and 2020. Farfly, a backdoor bot that gives criminals an entry point they can use or sell, was up 566%. We also saw Bitcoin Miner and KMS, a detection meant to identify software that enables people to use Microsoft software illegally, spiking as well. Now, Mac threats targeting business increased 31% between 2019 and 2020, and the detections for consumers and enterprise Macs were quite different. Data indicates the main threats to enterprise environments are malware and adware. And of all the malware detections on macOS, the top 10 malware families made up more than 99% of the total. The People at Malwarebytes advise businesses to take the time to clean out their systems and check for back doors that could be used to launch a ransomware attack or other operations whenever an attacker sees fit. And now there's a new tool for determining a new cybersecurity career pathway. Now, as a veteran of information technology and cybersecurity, I'm often asked, How do I get into a career in cybersecurity? Particularly when jobs are hard to come by and cybersecurity job shortage is still at an estimated 3.12 million as of November 2020, a number reduced by a mere 700,000 jobs by the pandemic. A career in cyber is all the more attractive. Now, we talk about cybersecurity every week on this show, I think. I think all the blips so far have been about cybersecurity or some aspect of it. So whether you're just getting started in IT or an IT veteran looking to pivot into this lucrative career we call cyber, it can be hard to know how to carve out that career path and make that change. Now, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, has recently released the Cyber Career Pathways tool. Now, this tool helps a prospective cybersecurity professional determine which spheres of cybersecurity they may want to get involved in and shows you what types of roles are available, along with the titles. You can then drill down on a role and see what skills and experience are required. It will also show you resources for developing those skills. 
Now, not all cybersecurity roles require deep technical knowledge. Many are related to risk and project management, just to name two. So if you're looking for a career change and are wondering how could you jump into a role in cybersecurity, this new tool is a great way to get started. Back in 1972, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak designed a and sold blue boxes that could circumvent telecom company billing systems in order to make free long distance calls. Pretty cool stuff. Now, in an interview years later, Steve Jobs said, experiences like that taught us the power of ideas, the power of understanding that if you could build this box, you can control hundreds of billions of dollars worldwide. That's a powerful thing. If we hadn't made blue boxes there would have been no Apple. Now, compelling, right? That's a pretty good story tolling. Now, Steve Jobs had that effect on people. Now, think how funny it is that now Apple is trying to position itself against right to repair. That's right. To some extent, it's the same story for every manufacturer out there. In fact, it's the same story for big tech in general. Hardware control, software control, data control, and in this upside down world of today, having a bit of control is something everyone wants. Am I right? Well, if left unmatched, things just might just get out of control. Now, the right to repair is the blanket term for laws being proposed to protect the regular person's ability to choose how and when to repair their devices and electronic equipment. Now, electronic manufacturers have historically limited this ability by making it difficult for folks to access parts, documentation, um, you know, whether they manufactured real special software equipment and to do the repairs and make them accessible to others. Now, I remember the days of the Sony PlayStation where people used to upgrade components and add better fans, and Sony wasn't having that. Now, with new tactics, Apple has more recently also started a campaign of psychological warfare here. In fact, they're warning people, quote, people will be, when replacing parts aren't purchased and replaced by them or unauthorized repair sellers, that could cause some problems. And the heart of this is the manufacturers want to control the rate in which people buy new hardware and devices and have additional cash flow from recycling the original devices. Now, in principle, owning something means to have control over that object, right? When the per- when you purchase something at the very least, you have the right to decide on how long you want to hold on to it and what you want to do with it. Unlike our personal data, uh, more abstract property in big tech, our hardware is more obviously like the rest of our other property, right? Because you hold on to it. Now, this thing brings up another topic. The rest of the world needs something like GDPR as well, because when you're owning something, you should be in control of it as well. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And that's Nareva. Now, as we think about heading back to the office, we know that the way we meet will change. Now, distancing can have big implications for meeting room audio and may require changes in room configurations. Now, the most important factor here is the need for good mic coverage when people are distanced in a meeting space. But most conventional audio systems don't offer the flexibility you need to easily accommodate changes. Beam forming systems will need to be adjusted often by really expensive technicians. Now, tabletop systems may require additional mics. You may have to sanitize those mics between meetings. Both may require meeting participants to change their behaviors like sitting in predetermined spots, which actually face in a particular direction. Now, what if there is a better way to get clear, reliable audio and let your team act naturally and still feel safe? Nareva Audio is designed For distancing. One analyst called Nareva Audio the first socially distanced mic system. Nareva uses a completely original approach to audio conferencing called microphone mist technology. It fills the room with thousands of virtual microphones. You get a true full room coverage so people can be heard from anywhere in the room no matter where they sit or face and how they are distanced. Now, you don't need to bring in new technicians with Nareva Audio. You can install each microphone and speaker bar on the wall by yourself. In fact, Nareva Audio automatically adapts to any room configuration. And microphone mist technology is so advanced, it actually has four patents. Nareva Audio products have won numerous awards, including the top new technology award at ISC 2020 for the Nareva HDL 200 system. No matter the size of your room, they have a full line of systems for small, medium and large spaces. Now HubSpot is actually a very happy customer. Jimmy Ann, their principal collaboration engineer says, we're so impressed with the sound quality, ease of install and ease of use of the HDL 300. It it was a no brainer for us to adopt it. To learn more how Nareva Audio is the simple and cost effective way to let your team's distance in meetings and still act and converse naturally, visit nareva.com slash twit. That's n-u-r-e-v-a.com slash twit. And we thank Nareva for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. 
Well, folks, that brings it to our bites, and we have a couple really good bites today. Now, you, you probably heard, we've talked about this story before. Over the last several years, the government has waged war on Huawei, calling the company a national security risk due, it, due to its alleged ties with the Chinese government. Now, an executive order barred companies, even international ones, from selling Huawei hardware or software that contained U.S. technology. Now, additional restrictions on trade with Huawei have made it extremely difficult for the company to keep building networking equipment and smartphones. Now, there's a new regime in the U.S., and Huawei is sending feelers out to test the waters with them. Now, one of the tools against Huawei was an FCC ruling last year that declared Huawei a national security threat and barred U.S. telecommunications from using government funds to buy Huawei gear. Now, Huawei has filed a lawsuit in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit challenging the ruling, calling it arbitrary uh, and abuse of discretion and not supported by substantial evidence. Guess what? The new FCC is defending the position. In addition to the Department of Commerce is in charge of Huawei's export ban, while, incom- while the incoming secretary said she would, quote, protect Americans and our network from Chinese interference, she also declined to promise to uphold the Huawei ban until a review has been completed. So we're talking about the FCC upholding it and the Commerce Department potentially upholding it. Uh, we've established kind of an axiom here that if the new FCC administration and commerce are not willing to roll back the restrictions on Huawei, that isn't that might be just enough to say that there might be something pretty darn good happening here, right? So I want to bring my co-host in. Um, you know, this is an interesting one, right? I mean, we're we thought that this was essentially a big ploy, potentially a um, you know, a marketing ploy, I guess you could say, of protecting Americans, um, uh, trying to, to, to define a narrative for Huawei uh, that they were a danger and that we were holding them back for a reason. But now we have a new administration, a new narrative, and they're still willing to uphold those sanctions and those restrictions. What do you guys think? I want to start with you, Curtis. Is this just a message to say, yeah, we, we this could be a danger to the country. Maybe we should be hold this stuff up. Well, I, I think that, uh, that Huawei is going to do, need to do a lot more than sending a pleasant message to uh, get off the uh, list <laughs> of unwelcomed hardware. Uh, there is a long history of Huawei uh, having some really interesting contents in their software. Uh, those contents uh, range from code that was lifted from U.S. networking vendors, often without even going to the trouble of filing off the serial numbers, uh, to things that uh, could, at least in theory, and this is something I have not personally seen, but according to people I trust, allow others to backdoor into systems. So I think they've got a long way to go to convince the U.S. regulators that all of the danger is past. And I think that there are things that they can use in other countries that are not nearly as effective in the U.S. In certain parts of the world, they go in and they are the low-cost provider, especially for 5G switching equipment. Uh, They are a major potential source of low-cost 5G here in the U.S. But at this point, I think the uh, U.S. carriers have... Uh, decided that they're just going to rely on other k- providers, kind of regardless of what Huawei does. So it, it's going to be an interesting distraction in the technology field for what I'm guessing is the next couple of years. And it's going to be fascinating to see what they roll out to try and convince U.S. regulators that they are all warm and cuddly. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, Ben, what do you think? I mean, what, this is going to be uh, require some changes even in their supply chain because, it, you know, obviously if they don't, if they don't change the narrative, they're, they're still going to be blocked. Yeah, it's it's hard. There's a lot of manufacturing even for uh, U.S. companies that happens in China, right? And uh, I think there's there's been a lot of uh, pressure put on, you know, I'll, I'll speak for F5 briefly here and try not to get myself in trouble. Uh, we're We're <laughs> – put under scrutiny by, you know, government organizations, large enterprises to say, to prove that, you know, we don't have any supply chain compromises, that we do proper due diligence in ensuring that what we manufacture uh, is not compromised somewhere along the way where, you know, uh, malware is inserted or something embedded in the firmware. Uh, 
So, so there are very real risks in, in anything you acquire. You know, we talk about solar winds, that's software supply chain, but hardware supply chain uh, uh, problems can be even harder to root out. Um, you know, even take, you know, the, the hysteria that, that occurred when uh, Bloomberg published those articles about Supermicro some years back about, you know, rice sized uh, chips embedded on the board. Right. These these are, you know, fears that 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 continue to come up over and over again. Uh, and so, you know, I'm inclined to think, well, where there's smoke, there's fire. Now, the difference with Huawei versus, say, a, a company like F5 or other, um, you know, U.S. based manufacturers of network hardware or server hardware is that you know Huawei is uh, you know a Chinese owned uh, company where you know even if the supply chain is great, uh, what if the supplier themselves are the people that we fear, uh, that we suspect of bad activity, and that become you know that that makes it impossible to even trust something like a trusted platform module, a TPM. Uh, so uh, for the enterprise uh, professionals in our audience today, um, if you're not familiar with that, read up on it. If you are familiar, you know that this is a, a chip that's embedded on, on many systems, sometimes optional, uh, where you can enable uh, something to basic. It's basically a checksum for hardware to ensure that it, it is as it's supposed to be. Um, but even that, if if the way it's intended, if the design intended by the manufacturer is to you know, create a backdoor for, you know, an espionage, nation state espionage by, you know, the, the, the country where they live. Now, you know, we know from our, our Huawei guest uh, from a few weeks back uh, that, you know, they maintain, you know, complete separation from their their owner. Uh, but I think that that begs credibility uh, that, you know, they can ma maintain such uh, complete separation and still um, function in an efficient uh, in manner that that you know, represents you know one company going to market. So I, I tend to fall on the side of just being very very cautious uh, because we 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 really have a lot of reasons to distrust uh, what's coming out of mainland China. Uh, they've got a long long history of of industrial espionage uh, against intellectual property in the in the U.S. and uh, I, I don't think, you know, you can look at the recent uh, anniversary of the APT1 report from Mandiant and FireEye and how groundbreaking that was and showing the, the depth and length of, of that type of espionage. So um, if, if the administration with all their extra intelligence says we, we need to continue this export ban, I'm inclined to, to side with them. Yeah, I'm actually glad you, you mentioned um, like Andy Purdy was on episode 404 of Twilight and he talked a lot about um, Huawei America and just how they've tried to separate the separation of concerns between mainland China's business and the American business. Curtis, I want to ask you, uh, I'm going to throw it over to you for the last uh, for the last word here. Um, they were trying to push the the message that they are fairly separated. They have third party um, you know, vendors and companies uh, verifying that. Um, uh, and auditing them uh, pretty pretty regularly, and so they're trying to again establish that narrative that they're separate, they're separate things, they're separate entities, and they operate separately. Um, and there's really no uh, push from the Chinese government coming on there. Is this something that they're going to have to continue doing in the United States going forward in order to to ensure that they also have that that separation uh, of of business entities there? You know, they really are, and they weren't helped in this claim of separation by what recently happened to um, Alibaba's uh, Jack Ma, who said some things that weren't even terribly uh, critical of the Chinese government, and he just disappeared for a while. So even though there may be separation, the question is how autonomous they really are. Uh, while there may not be a direct line in the organizational chart between uh, the hierarchy of Huawei and uh, the Communist Party in China, you can believe, and many American officials do believe, that there are all kinds of dotted lines there in the organizational structure. So I think it's going to take not only third party verification, but verification by third parties that the U.S. government trusts. And that may well be the tricky part in all of this. 
because it's quite easy to get some third party to say something nice. But to get a third party that everyone trusts, that can be a lot trickier. And like I said, I think this is going to be one we're hearing about for some time to come. The stakes are huge in both directions, and that means that this is definitely a game worth playing. Let's put that one to bed and move on to the next bite. Now, the solar, solar winds ordeal has really been the gift that keeps on giving in the security world. And you know what? There's, there's new information that keeps coming up every day. Curtis, you want to take us through some of the new stuff? I really do, Lou. I'm sitting here, pardon me, I was uh, jotting down some notes on this uh, while we were getting ready. Over at Dark Reading, uh, they've put together a story that talks about what we actually know. You know, even two months after all of this surfaced, there's a lot that we don't know, but it's worth looking at what we do know, even if that's a confirmation of what we don't. Confused? So is everybody else. So let, let's let's dive in on this one. First of all, we still do not know precisely how this attack started. We know some of how it spread laterally, but we we still don't know the initial threat vector. And that's important because when we don't know the initial vector, that means we don't know how to stop it from happening again to another organization. Most likely, they say it was through a credential compromise, but they can't be certain yet. Number two, there was more than one attack vector, especially after it started. For example, the component called Sunburst was one vector, but there was also a business email compromise going on certainly a multi-factor authentication bypass, and several other things. This was a very broadly focused attack within the organization. They were sort of throwing everything against SolarWinds. Number three, a medley of malware was used once they were doing this thing. Everybody knows of one called Sunspot. There was another Sunburst and Subrogate or Solargate. Uh, it was Teardrop, which was subsequent to the Sunburst Solargate. There was Raindrop, which was spread but not like Teardrop. And finally, there was Supernova, which is a backdoor in the key Orion component of Solar Wind. So, like I said, this was one that was very broad. And that means that not many people think that this was an individual or a small organization that was going after all of these targets. <clears throat> Speaking of the targets, the list of victims is massive. Um, we have solar winds that's reporting that there were more than eight, 18,000 organizations um, that were targeted around the world. Um, and in a number of these, we know that red team tools have been stolen. So that list of victims is going to grow. Who are those victims? Well, chances are if you've heard of the company or the government organization, they're a victim. So uh, it's big, it's profound, it's important. Now, with all of that, I mentioned not knowing whether it was an individual. We don't know who the threat actor was. Many researchers say that what we're seeing has all the hallmarks of a Russian operation, and some have gone so far as to say that they believe it was APT-29, also known as Cozy Bear, going after all of this. But no one really knows. Was it this organization? Was it one of their farm teams or a group of privateers allied with them? Was it someone just trying to um, go in and make it look like AP-29? We don't know. The things that are certain, it was someone well-funded with a great deal of expertise. How do we know about the expertise? Well, there was a tremendously high level 
of operational security in this attack. And they use multiple layers of safeguards. They used a dormancy period after the initial infection before any activity took place. They checked on system resources to make sure that the activity of the malware wouldn't raise red flags because of constraining system resources. Say what you will about whoever did this, they're good. And they made sure that this was a very stealthy attack, not noisy in the slightest. And finally, number seven, they used what some are calling the golden SAML gambit. Uh, the golden SAML goes after an organization's Active Directory Federated Services environment. This is an attack vector that was first described in 2017, uh, and it used SAML 2.0 for single sign-on. Basically, because they used this technique, they were able to bypass that multi-factor authentication we talked about. Now, <coughs> pardon me. I'm going to go, Bam, first to you. I mean, you deal with security architecture. What sorts of protections would you have to put in place to protect against everything we've discussed in the list of seven things we know about so far? Well, the number one thing is, and this is going to run counter to everything you hear about keep your systems patched, keep them updated, is don't let systems that have direct access to your critical infrastructure automatically update. So what does that mean? SolarWinds Orion is a monitoring solution. There's a reason these attackers went after SolarWinds. It's because if you compromise SolarWinds and get access to SolarWinds, now you've got something that is responsible for monitoring all of your, your critical networking and server infrastructure. I mean, literally fingers, tendrils into the network and into your, your enterprise infrastructure, unlike anything else probably that you run. So SolarWinds is, a, is an really optimal target because you've given permissions to SolarWinds to go talk to all your systems, uh, whether read-only or in, in full full super user access or what have you. So that's the number one thing, right, is, is if you have something that has this much access, make sure it's air-gapped. Make sure that the only way it can get updates is by you uh, going and directly applying them yourself. Uh, don't, you know, blindly patch systems without, you know, on, on critical systems such as these that have such a uh, high uh, leverage, uh, don't uh, patch them so fast. Uh, the other thing is, uh, even if you had patched them, assume, you know, you, you, you're you doing good system hygiene, you patched your solar wind system, it's on this latest version that puts you into the group of 18,000 customers who are potentially impacted by this. If that system is air-gapped, and it has these back doors in it. You've installed inadvertently, unknowingly installed these back doors. And it can talk to all your infrastructure, as I just said. Let's make sure that it's not directly connected to the internet so that the attackers can, can actually leverage those back doors. Now, there's a difference between having a back door that was installed by malware and, and these, this, this compromise of the software supply chain and having one that can actually be actively exploited by an attacker uh, because you, you've, you've done a good job of sequestering administration uh, hosts like this. Now, the other thing is something we talked about last week that you can do is even, assuming you've, you've all, already gapped the system, make sure that the the user accounts or service accounts that are used by SolarWinds to monitor all your systems are read-only and least privilege, policy of least privilege, which we, we, we talked about last week. Make sure that that's in place so that you have a secondary, so even if it does get compromised, what it can do, what the attacker can do to pivot from that compromised endpoint, which is your SolarWinds system, what they can do upon pivoting from there uh, becomes uh, you know, limited in, in terms of impact and scope. So those are two things, right? You know, air gap those systems that monitor and also limit their privilege to the systems that they do monitor. Okay, Ben, before I go to Lou with, with, with a question, I'm going to do a follow-up with you real quickly because while we know that SolarWinds is a tool for very large organizations, Global 1000, the government 
agencies, all of that. Some of the things that you're talking about, I know that there are going to be smaller business owners who say that sounds like a lot of work for my very small IT operation. It, what about your that you're talking about can smaller organizations reasonably do to protect themselves against this kind of third party risk? Well, this this kind of thing is actually fairly easy to mitigate, right? You can establish a bastion host that has, you know, very limited access. Uh, so a bastion host being, you know, that's the air gap thing, right? The only way for me to get to these other systems uh, on my on my network is is by having something with a heavy heavy duty multi factor on it, a uh, multi factor authentication enabled on it, so that even to get to that system to exploit the backdoor, I've got to you know get to multiple levels of uh, authentication. Uh, not hard to do. Quite frankly, there's uh, a lot of free and easy uh, multi-factor auth. Uh, I would say, you know, to those small business owners, look for SaaS solutions. Don't install stuff that you don't need. Uh, don't overcomplicate your network. I I ran SolarWinds myself on a very uh, small uh, network uh, in, in my career before F5, and uh, it, you know, there's you know. It's actually in use in a lot of uh, environments because they've got a, a really wide range of capabilities for the the simplest of shops all the way up to the biggest ones. And what I would say is don't overcomplicate your systems. If you're you know smaller shop, look for you know software as a service, infrastructure as a service, where somebody else is sharing the responsibility for establishing security. You know more on-prem systems means more responsibility for you to manage and keep things secured and lock them down. Um, and, and in this day and age, in 2021, um, most things are available in the cloud as a service or somebody else has already done the work for security and has assumed that risk on your behalf. And so take advantage of that. If you're a small shop, take advantage of that and, and, and scale your, your IT team that way by, by leveraging you know, service-based offers. Very good. Appreciate that. Now, Lou, I've got a question for you. We were talking about the kind of sophisticated code that went into the malware components of this attack. From what you have seen about this, are we talking about things that are truly advanced coding techniques in terms of obfuscation, the dormancy, the checking system resources, all of that, or is this the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, some really good adolescent hackers could do if they put their mind to it? It's interesting because I think that the sophistication in this hack comes from the planning aspect of it, how they and how they executed on it. Um, I think, you know, um, a lot of this is, has to do with the fact that. Uh, like Bam was saying, when we when 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 companies develop software, especially using open source software, they have a um, a false sense of security when it comes to it. Um, you know, we again we've talked about a lot of companies have defined this process that you know you should always stay up to date on the latest changes, especially because there could be security vulnerabilities in the software that you have, and staying up to date means that you're always up to date on those on those vulnerabilities. And so now we're backpedaling a little bit and say, wait a second, maybe if you move too quickly, you might actually, um, you might actually have a problem. Um, you might actually bring in a problem. Um, and so that's where, you know, you have to take more precaution. I think SolarWinds is learning from this. A lot of companies are going to be learning from this. Um, you know, Bam even talked about a lot, that, a lot of this, like when you're bringing in new software or new updates to your software before your build pipeline, um, you have to take into account a bunch of things. You have to make sure that whoever's updating that software, you've established presence, you've established their identity. Um, you know, they, they have JIT admin access to, to basically commit those changes. Um, and you, you're able to compare those changes. You're able to see what, what changes are actually being made, make sure that they're not obfuscated away um, and, and that you are doing the obfuscation. Um, so a lot of times you, um, you might actually have uh, some code that you import 
uh, in whether it's Python code or JavaScript or even C++ code, you actually import in uh, that it could be obfuscated uh, or just a binary that you're pulling in. Uh, and those could be bad. Those could be you're depending on things that might already have had a vulnerability built into it. And then you build it into your software. And so there there needs to be a lot more security precautions and auditing precautions put into the pipeline. Uh, and I think that'll definitely help. So is it was it sophisticated? Absolutely. It means that they figured out uh, what a normal software company does when it comes to a CI CD pipeline and their build pipeline and then they exploited it and they they sought they sat dormant until the point where they knew it was at critical mass and it had had moved out across across their their you know the internet and uh, and across all of the customers and then they struck they striked and I think you know this is an important lesson for all of us that you know open source is great so pulling in software is great but we also have to put a bunch of resources on it and validate it going forward. Well, folks, that does it for that bite. Thank you, Curtis, for driving that one. That was a good one. Um, I'm sure that this will continue to evolve over time, and we'll definitely hear some more about it. Next up, we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. But before we get to our guests, we also have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Forward Networks. Your network is mission critical to your business. Forward Networks will help reduce network outages, improve troubleshooting, and eliminate errors. They reduce business risk by revolutionizing the way large networks are managed. Now, four Stanford PhD graduates developed Forward Networks seven years ago when they developed empathy for network operators and sought to apply principles of modern software development to the network. Their advanced software delivers a digital twin of the network, a complete, accurate mathematical model in software and serves as a single source of truth for the network. The users can verify that their network is configured correctly, that it's compliant with policies and behaves exactly as they intended. They can accurately predict the impact of proposed changes across every possible traffic path so network operators can roll out changes with confidence. Now, this ensures your network stays healthy and agile at all times. Now, here are some additional things that Forward Networks does. Their dashboard provides key network insights with visualizations that are easily consumable and exportable. They automatically create an always accurate network diagram with full details about the topology of your environment. Search network behavior, configuration, and state network-wide with an intuitive and powerful tool set. Perform end-to-end -end path analysis across your network for both on-prem and cloud infrastructures. Proactively identify potential connectivity and security policy violations. Verify that your network is configured and behaving exactly as intended across on-prem, cloud, and virtual overlay networks. Set, check, and customize policies for your entire network. Network plus behavior diffs that allows side by side comparison in one quick view of configuration file changes for any device between any points in time. Get 50% faster resolution of network trouble tickets, 90% faster fixes related to auditing processes, and 33% reduction in aborted network updates due to identified errors. Imagine searching your network for what is causing a problem. Four networks allow you to do just that. PayPal was having issues with their network and considered building a better system. Instead, they turned to Forward Networks and found that they all they needed was software that could find the trouble spots, saving them time and money. Forward Networks collaborates with a range of infrastructures and application technology partners from world's leading IT companies to innovators. They've worked with Bank of America, Verizon, Goldman Sachs, and several large government agencies. Four networks announced their Series C funding round last October, led by Goldman Sachs. Also participating were Andreessen Horowitz and Threshold, formerly DFJ. In total, their investors have committed $65 million. Get network automation and verification for your intent-based network with Forward Networks. Your business depends on it. Get a demo at forwardnetworks.com slash twit. That's forwardnetworks.com slash twit. And check out their new podcast, Seeking Truth in Networking. You can download it wherever you get your podcast. Well, I thank Forward Networks, their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. Today, we have Damon Small. He is the Technical Director of Security Consulting at NCC Group. Welcome to the show, Damon. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You're welcome. So we uh, we normally start the show. We like to hear people's origin stories. Can you maybe take us through a short uh, journey through tech and what brought you to NCC Group? 
Uh, yeah, short story. Okay, started off as uh, studying music. Uh, the tech bug bit me in the early 90s, uh, working in a recording studio, dirt, doing uh, digital editing. Uh, eventually worked my way into systems administration. And then the uh, dot-com bubble burst in the 2000s. And that seemed like a good time to pivot, uh, which I did. And I've been focused on uh, information security ever since then, largely on the blue team side of things. But um, about five years ago, I had an opportunity to come to work with NCC Group, and I've uh, been here ever since. So it's been a great ride. Fantastic, fantastic. So I think we want to first start today. We, we heard a little bit about this story last week. We kind of went through it. Uh, about the Florida town that had the hack that actually could have exposed a bunch of people to a poisonous water. Um, yeah. And we, we know a little bit about it. Um, maybe you can take mm-hmm. us through it. Now, we, what we do know is obviously we know that they, they were able to access a team viewer account that had access to critical infrastructure as well as critical systems that allowed them to change the formula of the water. But there's still a lot mm-hmm. of unanswered questions going on here. Can you maybe take us through some of it? Yeah. And and by the way, you folks covered it quite well last week. I watched that episode and uh, I I personally don't know a ton additional from that last week. But I think some assumptions we can safely make are that, uh, you know, as you mentioned, TeamViewer is being used for remote access. The adversary gained access to TeamViewer. And by the victim's own account was accessing TeamViewer for something like three to five minutes. So the adversary, it seems, knew exactly what he or she was doing, right? Went in and started changing the formula, as you said, uh, uh, the concentration of lie from 100 parts per million to 11,100 parts per million. So I think we can assume at this point that the adversary knew what they were doing. So this wasn't just a script kitty that found an open port on Shodan or something. I think this was probably a little more targeted than that. Right. I think that that, that, that's the interesting part is, you know, what we what we actually read so far about this is the fact that they were not only were in the system, but they knew exactly where to go and what to change, which seems quite scary. Um, you know, the interesting thing part here is they did use just a very common tool, Team Viewer, which is used for kind of a remote desktop type solution. Um, do we have any more information possibly around like, well, did they just were able to to uh, to to steal an account or were they able to break a password on this account or or do we have anything else on that that particular part of it? Uh, yeah. So, again, this is somewhat speculative on my part, but sure. I. It, 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 because the operator who was near the workstation could see the mouse moving, it's a reasonable assumption that this was a shared account. Um, so I, if I were a betting man, I would say that this uh, was a shared set of credentials that the adversary got a hold of somehow. Uh, even, you know, I, I don't know if it was an insider or not, but I mean, if you're using shared credentials, that increases your threat landscape by a lot, right? Um, And again, because the operator was able to see what the adversary was doing, that that suggests um, either default credentials or, or perhaps easily guessed credentials. Now, during the press release that happened shortly after this, the sheriff uh, in Florida described this, uh, as a sophisticated attack, um, as a, uh, lay person who doesn't work in cybersecurity full time, it might seem sophisticated. I would respectfully disagree with law enforcement though, that if this were stolen credentials, uh, or a case of easily guessed or default credentials, that's not terribly sophisticated at all, actually. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think another thing that we we found interesting, and we we, we kind of got into a little bit of debate here, is the fact that they were even using uh, a tool like TeamViewer. And I think, uh, you know, I think Curtis was the one that said, hey, well, you know, some sometimes operators are not there, and the only way for them to control the systems is to have some kind of tool like that. Um, and, you know, I guess, like you said, law enforcement saying, hey, it was just as simple as them, like they were saying almost like a script kitty was able to, to 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 connect and just use this tool, but there should have been, and there probably was, bit some additional security layers in between there. But I want to we want to get your opinion. 
team viewer? Should it be used? Should it be on critical systems like this? Is there alternate methods? Uh, what a, what a great question. Yeah. And, and I've had this conversation uh, a lot with people from the operational technology side and people from the IT side and my colleagues in information security. Um, I would be careful, first of all, before I answer this question, we don't want to uh, blame the victim. We don't want to demonize remote access. Uh, and right. we want to recognize that keeping something like a water plant up and running uh, 24 hours a day uh, you know, is, is difficult. So one of my colleagues commented, this is critical infrastructure. Does something like team viewer belong on critical infrastructure? Well, honestly, even though I'm a computer scientist and I make my living doing computer geek things, the reality of it is this is a business decision that has been made, not a technological decision. By that, I mean, uh, if you have to have on-site support, 24 by 7, that becomes very, very expensive, potentially prohibitively uh, expensive, right? So um, I think using remote access software in and of itself is fine. I think what we need to do is make sure and advise operators that use remote, ac uh, remote access software to do it in a safe way. And by that, I mean, uh, don't use shared credentials. Um, use multi-factor authentication where possible. This came up earlier in this show today, multi-factor authentication. Uh, and lastly, don't expose these systems directly to the internet. Uh, presumably, these are authorized support people that are using the remote access software, so they ought to be able to have something uh, access to something like a VPN or I think Bam mentioned earlier, uh, Bastion Host, uh, uh, those sorts of things. So remote access software is is not the problem here the way it is implemented uh is the problem in my opinion good point good point well, i do want to uh, you know we do have a couple other security experts here on the show as well i do want to bring mm -hmm. my co-host back in starting with you curtis well one of the things that i wanted to to ask you know we we heard a lot of speculation in the first few days after this, that it might be, well, a practice run, something that uh, a threat actor was doing, going against a relatively small uh, water system. So a, a small, less sophisticated piece of critical infrastructure to see if a certain set of tactics might work with uh, the water system for a larger uh, municipal water system that could have an impact on far more people. Based on what you've seen of the attack, does that sound like a reasonable thing or is this much more likely to have been some sort of target of opportunity where they just happened to find some open credentials? Because as best I could see, a, a, a good showdown run could, could have probably given you all of the attack information you needed against this particular target. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on, Curtis. A, a good showdown run could probably give you many, many other targets. Um, uh, didn't this attack take uh, attack take place during Super Bowl weekend, right? So maybe it was an interesting time to try out, uh, you know, a target uh, at that time. But reconnaissance is something that the the bad guys do often, right? Just to see if an attack will work. And again, I'll go back to my earlier comment. Um, because the adversary was in for three to five minutes and knew exactly what to change and where to change it. And, it, and it's not like you just go download Microsoft SCADA, right? I mean, this is specialized software, and the adversary knew what they were doing. So it could have been a test run. And, you know, the follow-up question might be, well, are other um, industrial control systems – uh, in other municipalities, uh, potentially vulnerable, and I, 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 I'm afraid the answer is yes, they are. Well, you know, when when you're looking at this, we have heard from, uh, especially some of our uh, national cybersecurity leaders, that, that we know that there are uh, threat actors who have persistence on many of our critical infrastructure networks. 
aside from some of the obvious things that you've mentioned, uh, don't use shared credentials, um, don't use password as your password, you know, things that you would probably tell your eight-year-old to, to keep their, their school system safe. Are there lessons that operators of, of critical infrastructure should be learning from this incident? I, I think so. And and th this came up again earlier in last week's uh, show and earlier in this show, we talked about, you know, updating software and patching things. The problem is in <clears throat> in an in industrial control systems environment, in an OT environment, that might not be easy to do. You might not be able to apply patches um, the second Tuesday of every month, for example. So I think the lesson is that operators, the more they become dependent upon software, the more you have to monitor. And that means two things. Number one, you need to know what good looks like. You need to know what normal network traffic in your environment is. And number two, you need to be able to detect when something abnormal or anomalous starts taking place. Uh, now that's hard to do. It's easy for me to say, um, however, uh, absent the ability to update software and to, you know, put this air air gap back in place to block everybody uh, from getting into your environment, uh, that's what we can do. So, so monitoring wouldn't have stopped the attack, but if the operator hadn't been sitting in that chair, monitoring could have alerted um, somebody that uh, such an attack was taking place. Very good. Well, I know my fellow co-host, Brian McHenry, has some good questions he also wants to ask. Um, Brian, let's let's take it to another icy part of the country and uh, and let you ask our guests some questions. <laughs> hey, Damon, thanks for uh, joining the show here. This has been great. Uh, haven't been in this industry for a while. It seems like ICS and critical infrastructure. We've been sounding the alarm on this for two decades. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's gonna happen. Like something really bad is going to happen. Like it, it's so mainstream that it, that it's the plot to any number of thriller movies that are out there um, right. at the risk of getting political. What, what do we do to get uh, to, to wake up our critical infrastructure, uh, critical infrastructure providers to taking more proactive measures? We, we need to remind not just the operators, but uh, organizations and anyone that is dependent upon a critical infrastructure, and I'm going to use the critical infrastructure as defined by the Department of Homeland Security, that 30 years ago or so, these infrastructures were protected by virtue of the fact that they weren't connected to anything else, right? Right. These were standalone networks. They didn't talk to the enterprise. Um, there was this so-called air gap that existed between them. Uh, and for various reasons, many of them very, very good reasons, actually, back to the business case, those things are interconnected now. So for an attack to take place against a water authority 20 or 30 years ago, the bad guy would have to jump over a fence you know, with a bucket of poison and run over and dump it into uh, the water supply. And when uh, the bad guy or gal jumped over the fence, he'd probably be met with, uh, you know, someone with a gun and a dog, right? So physical security was very, very effective. Now that we've got interconnectivity between uh, the OT networks and the IT networks, these attacks can take place uh, from far away, from anywhere on the planet within with, with an internet connection. So I think we just need to, you know, technology is not bad, but I think we need to recognize that because the technology has advanced very, very quickly over the last 20 or 30 years, it has changed our threat landscape and therefore we need to change our response to it. Yeah, I, and and I think, you know, you, you touched on something there and I don't know if you'd be willing to comment further is uh, uh, Homeland Security is is issued, you know, has defined what critical infrastructure is, mm -hmm. uh, has even uh, issued fourth recommendations. Uh, do you mm -hmm. think 
you know, we're at a point where we need to legislate because because many of these uh, providers, right, it's not the operator sitting in front of the console. It's the mm-hmm. corporation that owns that water authority, that owns that uh, power authority, what have you. Are we at the point where we need to legislate, uh, you know, compliance and, and get into, you know, what we, we, we hold – our credit card standards, our credit card security standards at, at a higher level of compliance than we do critical infrastructure systems, right? We, we mm-hmm. audit the crap out of anybody that processes a 16 digit number. Uh, should we be, you know, moving into, you know, exerting more compliance standards on, on these uh, infrastructure providers? Uh, what a timely question. Well, um, you know, I live in Texas, so I just went through a critical infrastructure uh, incident uh, living here where the power grid uh, suffered greatly. Uh, it, 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 let me answer it this way. If we could depend on everybody and every organization to do the right thing because it was the right thing to do, then we wouldn't need law enforcement and we wouldn't need regulations. I think and again, I, uh, let me be clear, it's not to demonize the operators and not to demonize organizations. They're doing the best they can to, to run their businesses. But like I said earlier, the threat landscape has changed. It has increased. Now that we're interconnected with enterprise networks, it's a different world we're living in. And I, I don't expect my clients, I don't expect the businesses I work with to become computer scientists. It's up to me to understand the language of business. So it's not reasonable to expect these organizations to fully understand why the threat landscape has changed and what that means. So you're not wrong. I'll, I'll stop just short of saying, yes, we need to have regulation, but that it, that is certainly something that we should consider. You, you know, Like you mentioned, um, uh, our credit card information, that's PCI. Well, as it turns out, PCI is not a regulation, right? It's not a law. It's a standard that everybody agrees to use if you're going to use credit cards for payment processing. Um, it, it, but I, I, I don't think that concept is, is um, irrelevant, right? I, I mean, we need to help these organizations understand what the lowest bar of behavior is to protect these critical infrastructures because they're not experts at it. it it's, you know, it, it, they, and nor should they be expected to be experts at it. Right. Right. Well, Damon, thank you so much for being here. Unfortunately, we're running just a little bit low on time, but we do want to give you a chance to maybe tell us, tell the folks home a little bit more about the NCC group, um, some of the consulting they do and maybe how they can get in touch with you and maybe get involved. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and by the way, sorry about my terrible connection. I'm going to assume it's because all the copper is frozen here in Texas. So <laughs> no problem. Uh, but the NCC Group is a publicly traded consultancy. We're based in Manchester, United Kingdom. Uh, I'm in Texas. As I mentioned, we have offices all over the globe. Uh, I've got about 1,800 uh, colleagues that I work with. So we're a large consultancy. Uh, we've got, I like to say, at least one of every kind of computer nerd you can imagine. So we work uh, in large enterprises and, you know, from from top to bottom, from application security to network architecture, um, uh, you know, we we've got a very broad uh, base of skills. So um, I'd, I'd love to talk to you all more. Um, I mean, if you want to reach out to me directly, but probably, you know, the quickest way I'm on Twitter, uh, Damon Small on Twitter. Uh, and if uh, you like, I can share my uh, my professional email address if you reach out to me. And anyway, it's been great fun, guys. Thank you for having me on today. Thanks again. Well, you've done it again. You sat through another out of the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. So tune your podcatcher to Twilight. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host, starting with Mr. Brian McHenry. Brian, what's going on for you in the coming week and where can people find you and all your work at F5? Well, you can find me, as always, at B.A. McHenry on Twitter. Uh, I'll be sharing things like uh, my recent live stream appearance on Dev Central Connects. That's F5's community uh, podcast, uh, as well as, uh, you know, I'll share all my activity here on Twiat. And uh, one thing I want to highlight this week is uh, F5 Labs. I've talked about it on the show in the past. Uh, we 
share all kinds of free security research. It's not about uh, F5 products or technologies. It's really just you know what's going on in the security landscape. A uh, really big uh, report that took a lot of time and effort to put together uh, with help from our experts over in Shape Security. It's the 2021 Credential Stuffing Report. Uh, this is all about you know how you know how many breaches have happened, leaked credentials that keep coming out you know, year after year, and then how are the attackers using them to ex- execute these credential stuffing attacks? And uh, this year, it's a it's a great report because we're the first time we're doing it with the help of our friends from Shape, and and not for nothing, but one of the founders of Shape Security, Samit Agarwal, who's one of our uh, still with with us at F5, is the coiner of the phrase credential stuffing. So no bigger, better experts on credential stuffing, and we've got a really in-depth report to share and it's free for anybody to download and and take a look and see how it might uh, alter your threat model. Fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Well, we also have to thank Mr. Curtis Frank as well. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming weeks? Where can people find you and all of your work? Well, you can usually find me hanging out on uh, Twitter at KG4GWA and uh, over on LinkedIn, Curtis Franklin. As for what I'm going to be doing, I'm doing some research right now on some dashboards, enterprise security dashboards, and I would love to know what the Twiat Riot thinks about them. So if you've got thoughts on how you're using enterprise security dashboards, what you wish you could do with them, uh, drop me a direct message over there on Twitter. I accept direct messages. Would love to hear from you. Uh, Maybe uh, chat about uh, what you think companies should be doing. It's kind of what I do these days. Fantastic. Thank you, Curtis. And thanks for all that you do. Well, of course, we have to thank you as well. You are the person who drops in each and every week to get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and get your enterprise and IT news. Go to our show page right now twit.tv slash twiat there you can find all the amazing back episodes the show notes the co-host information the guest information and of course more importantly next to those videos you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links support the show by getting your audio version your video version of your choice and listen on any one of your devices or and on any one of your podcast applications as well because we're on all of them and it's definitely the best way to stay on top of your news as well as support the show. Now, if you're going to subscribe, you might as well impress your friends, your family, your co your coworkers with subscribing as well and with the gift of Twiat because you know what? We talk a lot of a lot about some fun topics here on Twiat, and we definitely think that if you share it with them, they'll fun they'll find them fun as well. Now, if you uh, also can you've already subscribed and you, uh, you, you're available right now, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on Fridays. We do this show live, live.twit.tv. Come see how the show's made behind the scenes. Come see how the pizza's made uh, and all the banter and the fun stuff that we do here on Twit. And that's, again, live.twit.tv. And, of course, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into our amazing chat room as well, irc.twit.tv. That we have some amazing characters. We had some really great conversations in there today. In fact, even the guest was in there today. So thanks a lot, a lot for Damon for being there. Um, we had some really great commentary. So if you want to jump in there, that's a good good time to do that. Of course, if you can't be, you can't watch the show live, but you're already subscribed and you still want to be part of the conversation, we have a great place for you to go as well. It's twit.community. It's a great website that's out there. And in fact, the whole community is out there and it's 24 seven discussion around technology, around the shows that we do around, uh, you know, with the co-hosts and the, and the hosts are all out there. So definitely check it out and be part of the conversation 24 seven. Remember, you can always follow me twitter.com slash Lou MM. There I post all the latest and greatest enterprise tidbits. Some of the things that I do here at Microsoft, you can also check that out at developers.microsoft.com slash office. So we post the latest and greatest ways to customize your office experience. And of course, I have to thank everyone who makes this show possible because we couldn't do it without them. And that's especially to Leo and Lisa because they continue to support This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week. And again, we really couldn't do couldn't do it without them. We also have to thank all the engineers and staff members at Twit because, again, it's a, cl- a cumulative effort and they definitely help and, and support the show as well. Of course, I want to thank Mr. Brian Chi. He's lurking somewhere behind the scenes there. He's not only our co-host normally, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He uh, he does all the bookings and uh, and also helps a lot, gets all the guests and, and some of the content for the show. So, Cheever, thank you so much for all your support, and we wish you good luck in house hunting and everything like that. Are you, are you, are you there to, uh, to at least give us a wave? Is he there? No? 
Okay, that's okay. Well, before we sign out, we do have to thank our editor, Mr. Victor, as well as our TV for today, Mr. Ant Pruitt. He is the man of many talents, and he's got a lot going on at Twit. Ant, what's going on for you in the coming week uh, here on Twit? Still continuing to work on my show, hands-on photography, and just recently I put a picture up on Instagram, and people seem to like it, so I decided, huh, why not just make an episode about it? And it's the Thanos effect opening up Photoshop and having some fun. Very cool, very cool. I've always wondered how you could do that. You'd have to go go check that out. Thanks again, Ant. And of course, until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. If you like Android with a heavy dose of fun and entertainment, then you're going to love all about Android. It's me, Jason Howell, along with my co-hosts, Ron Richards and Florence Ion. Every Tuesday, we discuss the news items that matter most, the hardware and devices that are running Android, and the apps that run on top of them. Plus, we answer your email each and every week. That's all about Android on twit.tv.